In a previous segment, we looked at this example that said, locate all the absolute extrema and minima of f by inspection, then check your answer using calculus. And we were only able to do the first part, which was to use inspection to find the absolute maximum. And we found that the absolute maximum um, occurred at the point um, negative 151. So we could say that it had an absolute maximum of z equals 1 at the x and y values negative 1, 5. So now we're going to do the second part. We're going to solve this problem as if we didn't know um, where the maximum was going to occur using the, the uh, facts that we've learned, uh, the calculus facts that we've learned. So for the first portion, we need to identify the critical points. And what we know is that critical points occur by definition where the partials, the first order partials, are equal to zero. So in order to find critical points of a function of two variables, we're going to need to find the first order partials. In this case, the first derivative with respect to x holding y is a constant. Well, the derivative with respect to x of 1 is just zero minus the derivative of x plus 1 squared with respect to x is 2 times x plus 1 to the first power times the derivative of x plus 1, which is just 1, minus, now since y is a constant, y minus 5 squared is a constant, and so this is going to just be 0. Simplifying, we're going to have negative 2 times x plus 1 for our partial with respect to x. Now let's find our partial with respect to y. Again, a constant's derivative is 0. Since x is being held constant, this expression is 0 as well. And then the derivative of y minus 5 squared is going to be 2 times y minus 5 to the first power, and by the chain rule we multiply by the derivative of y minus 5, which is just 1. So this simplifies to negative 2 times y minus 5. Now, a critical point occurs where these are 0 or undefined. I should specify where these are both 0, or where one of them is undefined. Now, neither of these expressions is ever going to be undefined because polynomials are defined everywhere, but they each can be zero, so let's check that out. So in order for negative 2 times x plus 1 to equal zero, that would mean that x would have to be negative 1. And in order for negative 2 times y minus 5 to equal zero, that would mean that y would have to equal 5. So now let's find the z-coordinate of the point where x is negative 1 and y is 5, and we'll have our critical point. So plugging into the original function f of x, y, we're going to have f of negative 1, 5 is equal to 1 minus negative 1 plus 1 squared minus 5 minus 5 squared, which is going to be 1 minus 0 minus 0, or 1. Okay, so the critical point is the point negative 1, 5, 1. All right, now the second step is to determine the behavior of the function at that point. And right now, or really our only tool for doing that is besides inspection anyway, is to use the second partials test. Which means that we're going to have to find the second order partial derivatives at negative 1, 5. So let's find fxx at negative 1, 5 first. And so that's saying the partial with respect to x of the partial with respect to x of, and we're holding um, y to be constant at 5, and then we'll evaluate when x is negative 1. So plugging into our function, we have 1 minus x plus 1 squared. That's going to go to 0 because y is being held constant. 
Now we've actually already found this. This is going to be um, the partial derivative with respect to x of negative 2 times x plus 1. Okay, but the partial with respect to x, in this case this is only an x function, so it's just the regular old derivative, which is going to give us negative 2 evaluated at x equals negative 1, but since it's a constant it's not affected by that. So next let's look at fyy at negative 1, 5. So that's going to be the partial with respect to y of the partial with respect to y of the function over here with negative 1 plugged in for x. So that's going to be 1 minus 0 minus y minus 5 squared. Okay, and all of this evaluated when y is 5. Alright, so this is going to be the partial with respect to y of, well this derivative is going to be negative 2y minus 5 to the first power times 1. And then taking the derivative here, we're just going to have a negative 2, which is negative 2. Next we need to calculate fxy at negative 1, 5. Now we want to be careful here because remember the notation's kind of backwards, so what we're saying is that um, we're going to take the derivative with respect to x and then whatever we get for that we want to find the partial of that with respect to y. Okay, now for the partial with respect to x we're going to be holding y to be um, constant but we're not plugging in the 5 until the end. But in any case, we're going to have um, this whole expression in here. Okay, so when we differentiate with respect to x, holding y as a constant, then that means that we're going to have the partial with respect to y of, now here, um, 0 minus the derivative with respect to x, negative 2, x plus 1 minus, and the derivative of this is just going to be 0. Now, letting x be constant then, this whole expression is going to be constant with respect to y, so we're just going to get 0. And now the whole thing needs to be evaluated for x equals negative 1 and y equals 5, but in this case again we got a constant and so it's not going to change anything. Next we need to find d. If you recall, d is fxx, fyy, which was negative 2, negative 2, minus fxy squared, which is 0 squared. So d is going to turn out to be 4, and the significance of this is that it's positive greater than 0. Now remember on the second derivatives, uh, so rather, excuse me, second partials test, this narrows us down to one of two possibilities. Either d is greater than 0 and fxx is greater than 0, in which case we have an absolute minimum or the other possibility for d greater than 0 is fxx is less than 0, in which case we have, I'm sorry, not absolute, that's important, relative, in which case we have a relative maximum. So we have one or the other. Now fxx turned out to be negative 2, so we're looking at the second scenario here. 
Okay, so we have a relative maximum at the critical value that we found before, which was negative 1, 5. So at negative 1, 5, we have a relative maximum of z equals 1. Okay, now how do we know if it's an absolute maximum? Well, our theorem doesn't give us a way of answering that question, so we're going to have to just resort back to algebra. So in this case, what we're really asking is for z equals 1 minus x plus 1 squared minus y minus 5 squared, is it possible for z to be greater than 1? And so we're asking ourselves to solve the inequality 1 minus x plus 1 squared minus y minus 5 squared greater than 1. Well, that's the same thing as saying it's possible for x plus 1 squared negative minus y minus 5 squared to be greater than 0. Or dividing through by negative 1, that means the same as x plus 1 squared plus y minus 5 squared being less than 0 which we can tell is not possible because we're adding two positive numbers. We can't get a negative number. So we can conclude not only that this is, an, is a relative maximum, but this is an absolute maximum at z equals, or I should say of z equals 1. Okay, now one reason why we had to do this extra work here is because we have a function that's not bounded. It goes on forever. We're going to see in the next segment that when we look at functions that are bounded that are on a restricted domain, that this is not necessarily the case, that we have some other um, tools that we can use to determine whether we have a relative or absolute maximum.